Hey, how are you? I'm good, juggling too many crazy things as usual. So You're what's, what's got, so, so where are, what's going on? Where are you? What have you been? Tell me about, well, tell me who you are first for the purposes of this. So yeah. who is Daniel Kraft? So who am I? Uh, uh, I am Daniel Kraft. I'm a physician scientist out of Northern California. Um, on founding faculty of Singularity University where I chaired the medicine side of, of the thing since it started in 2008, 2009. Um, I like to look at, uh, the future of health and medicine through the lens of you know where technology can take us uh, from health and wellness and longevity and health span to what we can do with diagnostics, therapy, global health, mental health, uh, and beyond. And I've, I started and chair a program called Exponential Medicine, where the theme is to get people out of their usual silos of different subspecialties and different t technologies and, and mix it together to help catalyze the future in, in effective ways. And um, during this wonderful COVID pandemic, uh, I haven't I got on a plane for three months, which is a, the longest time I haven't traveled in a long, long time. Um, and I've been involved uh, on the COVID side with the couple projects. The big one is chairing the uh, uh, the task force for the X Prize Pandemic Alliance. So it's an alliance of 60 plus companies, NGOs, academic groups, etc., cetera, um, co-led by, uh, by X Prize and Anthem. And uh, we have this pretty amazing task force where we try and connect the dots and look at all the flowers that are blooming and all the kind of disruptions, some of which are positive, and try and connect the dots to solve for the pandemic challenges of today and the near and distant future. Um, that's a little bit of what's been going on lately. Um, and I'm still trying to figure out what I'm going to be when I grow up. <laughs> so so do, you see, do you define yourself as a transhumanist, or at least is that a label that is comfortable for you? Absolutely. And if not, Absolutely if not. I actually, frankly, I really don't like that term. <laughs> it sort of feels to me uh, for some reason, I've always had a bit of an allergic reaction to that term specifically. I would never describe myself as a transhumanist, even though I'm, you know, connected to my smartphone and have a brain computer interface and did my exercise this morning in virtual reality and, and certainly see how that term in the blending of biology and technology is, is happening. But just for some reason, I feel that needs a rebrand in some ways. I think it's sort of sometimes you know, makes people think all around the sort of Alcor side of what you have in the movie, which sometimes makes people uncomfortable and also might get in the way of people's embracing um, or leveraging it. That's just my personal take, rational as it may or may not be. Oh, no, I mean, look, I think, I think words are really important. I think how we f define ourselves and ways, like, if you look, the whole, like, for example, for the whole defund the police, I think it's the worst label like i really do like i think i agree with a lot of the demilitarize the police reorganize defund the police has it's such a so yeah i i get it i i, I understand what you're saying so you so i so there are various aspects of what transhumanism is that you feel comfortable in but you don't like the term so tell me from i mean fm 2030 did you how much did you know about him what did you learn how much of, I guess, how he saw the future or transhumanism or, or whatever, do you agree with, do you disagree with, do you find um, interesting? Any adjective that takes? Yeah, I mean, I, he was clearly ahead of his time uh, and certainly bringing these things out. Some of them now seem like, at least in the Singularity University world, kind of relatively common conversations or with Aubrey de Grey or thinking about, you know, from life extension to extending the quality of life, uh, or how do we upload our brains and, you know, what is biology and, uh, you know, all the things that are rapidly accelerating from gene editing with CRISPR, CRISPR, CRISPR rising babies to um, experiments with, you know, brains, micro brains in a dish. So I mean, I think he was quite prescient about the potentials and potentially also some of the um, challenges and, and potential opportunities. So I, ha I think I heard of him through you, and certainly, so I, ha I don't know that I had a lot of great background before seeing your movie, reading a, a bit more about him. Um, I do think there is something around this idea of a bit of the escape velocity, meaning technology is advancing. Sometimes in healthcare, it is slower than we want. You can't make a COVID vaccine or gene therapy and accelerate that into one month by having nine times the number of people working on it. Something like you can't take nine women to make a baby in a month. Some of these things just take time particularly in the healthcare sphere for safety and efficacy reasons. Um, but I, I do think there's a potential to sort of extend our 
our healthy biology uh, by being proactive. Uh, things you espouse like veganism and your diet are certainly, you know, food as medicine is certainly there. Um, I do think that there, there does seem to be some biologic limits to uh, if our, maybe our bodies will keep going, but our brains seem to have some more finite elements. And the fact that the oldest recorded human is 120 something uh, seems to dictate some of that. So um, at the same point, we're, we're in this era still of this magical uh, exponential age of molecular biology, synthetic biology, and our ability to discover and implement is getting faster. And some of these things, whether it's the, the biological clocks um, and reversing those or some of the more simple interventions like intermittent fasting uh, can play an incremental role, but big leaps to go if we're going to get to true immortality. In terms of the, the, some of the themes of the film, I mean, some of them have really played out. I mean, what do you think are conversations, I mean, even in, well, particularly in your field, medicine, um, that need to take place? I mean, how, I mean, it's funny, like, like I think FM's second book was called Telespheres, where he advocated, I mean, a lot of the things that we're seeing play out even now, even how we're, we're speaking. It, it's funny that you took this to utilize some of the things that were so available to us. So what do we need to, what are some of the societal conversations that need to take place? Well, some of them that are starting to emerge and are particularly more relevant in the time of the COVID pandemic with 120,000 plus Americans have already died, let alone around the world, is our conversations about end of life and what our wishes are. Um, at my Exponential Medicine Conference, we've had a couple of sessions on, you know, uh, ending well. And there's actually a whole new uh, program called End Well, started by a uh, palliative care doctor, Shoshana Ungeleiter. You know, how do you think about um, having those communications, sometimes using technology, there could be an app <laughs> with your preferences, you know, say I'm DNR uh, and understand, you know, understand the parameters of that as an individual and your wishes and communicating that to your friends and family. It might be a, a Facebook uh, checkbox um, or to be an organ donor, all the way to ways we have to think about um, uh, end of life and in, in the setting of COVID, you know, people dying alone and using FaceTime to communicate uh, with their loved ones or having their you know, virtually, even if they're not conscious. So it's catalyzed some of those communications. Um, so I think that's one communication that in medical school, at least traditionally, often hasn't been broached. Um, people try to avoid it. I think there's now more openness to looking at that human side of our, our uh, human uh, uh, condition. Um, because in healthcare, you know, I spent plenty of time working in intensive care units. We're often pushing things and flailing things for those extra one or two days or maybe month of life, but the quality is horrible enough and it feels quite... Um, uh, you know, we spend so much of our dollars and, and focus on those last couple of months of life where if we shifted the equation to more of the health and prevention side, uh, that can make the biggest difference in actually giving us longer, healthier, active lives and, and years. And what are the, I mean, what are the challenges for us to get to that place? And then I want to take sort of a step further. I mean, you speak to somebody like Ken Hayworth, who, who we have, we help organize some of the content for his brain preservation who really believes of being able to, to scan our brains for an eventual upload or I, I mean and making that part of like you know this is like something that you get at a hospital do you know so in order for the first part that we actually just get healthcare and get good health care and get what are the obstacles and and then the subsequent question is if that was to happen how likely would something like Ken Hayworth's vision of of being able to scan one's brain for an eventual upload. Yeah, I mean, two thoughts. First things first, I mean, we don't do a good job of doing all the basic health and elements, prevention, proactive, uh, screening, all the things that would. You don't need magical uh, gene therapies or brain computer interfaces to hopefully extend our healthy brain life and body life um, if we do things earlier in, in, our, in, our, in our years or even in our later years to um, be much more preventative and proactive. And so there's all those sort of simple, smart things from, from diet and exercise and mindfulness that are sort of not high tech, but have a huge impact um, that we need to be spending more time and resources on uh, right now. Because again, we live in a sick care model where we pay for disease and that's how the rewards are rather than paying for the sort of health and prevention side. Um, as to uploading a brain, I mean, it's interesting how this has gotten in the zeitgeist. Have you seen the, is it the Netflix, Netflix series yeah. that I've been upload Amazon, Amazon, yeah. Amazon. It was really it was brilliant kind of dark comedy uh it was at least you know pushing the envelope of it almost felt possible right 
um, except that people lost their literal brain at the beginning uh, during the episode. <laughs> that was funny. That was, what is that was a great so much, yeah, And there's so much magical stuff happening with, you know, optogenetics and the, you know, the, the, the see-through brain work out of, out of MIT and some of the work from Carl Dysroth and others, I mean, about understanding the circuitry and being able to map and, and, and you know, scan pieces. I'm not a neurobiologist or understand consciousness or memory. I would just think, you know, we are in a bit of that exponential to be able to measure and potentially reconstruct. But is that, even if you were able to reanimate, are those actual memories there? Can consciousness come back? What is consciousness? Um, or as we can already do now, you could do a bunch of recordings of me and scan me and have me as an avatar and have a bunch of my, my voice, voice cloned and a bunch of my prior history. And I could tell the same jokes and we could feel like we're interacting you know, it's sort of a, a, a Turing test type of avatar. That would be another way yeah. to sort of live quasi mortally. Uh, he's still very healthy and alive, but um, Deepak Chopra even has virtual Deepak, you know, that'll take you through uh, coaching. Or we're seeing avatars come to, to the health space as health coaches as, as well that feel very real. So, and that's just an ever, different kind of immortality. I would think, oh, Amazon's talking at me. It heard, Alexa heard, heard his name. <laughs> uh, so our virtual, you know, we could have virtual companions that will, be the kind of quasi consciousness of our of our friends and family, even if they're completely uh, silicon. I, I, you know, I, as you were saying that, I was thinking as my that my, that my mother, that the, all that I have, the memories that I have of my mother, or those pieces that I have of my mother, I would have all the annoying pieces of my mother because that's that those the ones that are most visceral. So I'm not sure. I I want the best parts. I don't know. It's consciousness. So. So do you think these are pipe dreams and, and in terms of figuring this stuff out? I mean, is this, uh, I mean, I guess, look, these, we've got real problems directly in front of us, which I think was your first point. And some of these problems aren't that hard to solve if there is a will and there is resource. I think the, I think the question was challenges. I think you've expressed the challenges, but what makes them challenges are resources and will, right? Or are there other pieces? I mean, in terms of this sort of, first tier of um yeah a lot of it are misaligned incentives right here in the u.s we have that sick care system other systems including nhs and others or even some u.s systems are are payer player and they're they're aligned on keeping you healthy and living as long as possible others are going to lose money if uh you don't have to keep taking that drug or don't show up in the hospital for your bypass surgery etc so um some of it is you know is healthcare human right um all the kind of key things health technology broadly speaking, only impacts about 15% of our health outcomes. It's all those key, often buzzwordy, social determinants of health. You know, what zip code you grew up in? Uh, did you live, you know, with too much lead in your water? Um, did you get your vaccine, vaccines? Do you live near uh, in a food desert where you can't access regular, you know, fre fruit, fresh fruit and vegetables? So, and social connection, right? All that is, you know, it's more dangerous to live in isolation to feel lonely than to, to be smoking two packs a day. So all these are quite complex variables that in the socium, you've heard of the genome, and our genome certainly impacts our, 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 our risk and our ability to live long, healthy lives or not, not to do so. But it's our socium and those pieces around it that almost seem to be more key. So all those things being said, um, I think technology is advancing so quickly. I mean, the last 10 years were pretty miraculous. Now we're ending into the era of quantum computing, which that's way beyond my pay grade, but you know that potentially could be on the medical side, helping design new drugs. Might be unlocking the biology of aging, um, and so many things could happen uh, in the next 10, 20 years that again are almost hard to predict because our brains are still linear, and a lot of these things exponentially are still hard to kind of imagine. You know what's possible, um, even when you had your very first iPhone one. I actually have my, my iPhone two is over there. It's an antique. Ten years ago, when we had iPhone tunes, it was pretty magical. It was pretty amazing. Now it feels slow and clunky and low resolution. My iPhone 11 is pretty incredible, but in ten years that may have shrunk into my contact lens or my Apple augmented reality uh, vision device, uh, and that will feel antique. So I don't want to have a failure of imagination. And I think biology and the brain mind connection is one of those frontiers that's just being unlocked um, or starting to be unlocked pretty dramatically from you know the ability to image the brain with fMRI to interact with the brain with electricity to magnets. Um, that's still quite different than uploading a brain, um, but uh, our understanding of the software meets the hardware is getting there. Just because it's on my mind is actually not the, the linear question. I had another question for you, but, but if, you, if you could upload your, your, your um, consciousness, your brain, 
into an, an environment, whether it's uh, an afterlife or a, a holding space or whatever. What for you? What would your what would your um, afterlife or holding space be? What would it be like? What would you have? Um, give me a sense. Well, that's a great question. Um... Well, I'm someone who likes variety and I'm social. I like to try new things and, and it's hard to say, oh, I want to just go to this Hawaiian island and live on, you know, uh, drink coconuts and, and margaritas. Um, I, I mean, I, this is not a, maybe my failure of imagination, but I'm looking across the room at my Oculus Quest, which is also a pretty amazing device. The fact that you can go in a virtual environment and be pretty much anywhere uh, and interact with people and it's still early. It's going to look pretty kludgy uh, in a few years. It'll be even, you know, 6k 8k won't it'll look you know your consciousness can kind of go anywhere and you can have your sort of intake be from anywhere so i can almost imagine this sort of future world where your consciousness can go where it wants visit who and where you want to be learn interact uh and contribute i think and still grow right there's some theories of, of happiness you know you, you might have everything well multi-billionaire but if you're not growing and learning and uh, achieving in some form um Folks often get depressed and don't feel like living. Yes, I mean, we, we, we have to have a space where, where we can do that and at least feel like we're growing. I mean, look, it's all, you know, some of this is, you know, and we get back to this idea of consciousness, experiential. What is that experience? How do we experience, you know, in this space where we could, where it could be galaxies, and we could be swimming, and we could be diving, and we could be flying, and we could have um, kebabs for breakfast and be on, um, Maria Kadja and Herzliya for the afternoon and in some mm -hmm. further galaxy in the afternoon later on. No, it's a, it sounds amazing. So I like, I like any other facets of your, of your um, world that you'd, you'd want in, in there? Now that you could have your sort of virtual consciousness or you could have sort of a representation of that that's going to sort of act like you. Knows, knows my favorite color. Well, blue, right? I don't, I mean, I, think, I, I would like to think that it, that, that it's, that that you'll that you'll have it'll feel like you. You're going to be in this space, and it'll feel like you. You won't know the difference from it being real or not real. I mean, I, I you know, I hope. I mean, if I, you're going to go through all that trouble and be uploaded to something, you want it to feel as whatever re, real means. Is, was that your question? Yeah, anyway, and not also you know seeing it, but actually feeling it. I mean, now we're in the era of sort of avatars. There's actually an avatar enterprise underway right now to build sort of almost inspired by the movie where you can you know, basically upload your consciousness into a robot and walk around the streets of Paris where we were last in person uh, and feel like you're there. Um, uh, so that's not so far-fetched. That's part of your movie almost, you know, how do you connect the brain back to some <laughs> uh, uh, actionable entity? Um, so I think, you know, uh, I, I still think there's a difference between it actually being my sort of actual consciousness versus a representation of it that acts like me or can interact like me with others, right? So, you know, uh, virtual Daniel uh, could take all my Facebook feeds and other digital exhaust and theoretically reconstruct me. And, and I have no idea what exactly consciousness is uh, at, at the biological level, but my friends, like you might want to talk to Divya Chander who's a MD, PhD anesthesiologist and puts people to sleep for a living, but also looks at their consciousness when they go into uh, anesthesia when they come out. And what are those patterns and how does the brain reboot? And, uh, you know, what is dreaming? All those things are now getting uh, digitized. And so from there, we might end up understanding how to reconstruct it. Look, this is the question, isn't it, really? I mean, what's consciousness? What does it mean? <laughs> like, I, I think if, if it's one of the big questions anyway, certainly. Yeah, and, what, and when is it uh, a simulation versus real consciousness? I just started... Uh, I'm so behind. I don't watch much TV, but I started watching Westworld, right? And that's another example of these robots, essentially, that have a form of consciousness, right? So um, when you create that in a, in a machine or in some hardware, software, biologic, because now we can program biology, um, you know, where, where the, where the, what's the neural circuitry for consciousness? I don't think we still know that. We know you can knock it out with certain lesions. Um, so yeah. it, it's a fascinating area, yeah. You know, FM, and this is the piece that gets lost a lot, really felt like we needed to have various breakthroughs before we got to this place of extended longevity or immortality, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it felt that, that there were these things that had to happen. This idea, there was this optimism. It was a lot of first here, optimism, abundance, universalism, and then immortality. And I think a lot of people who critique him sort of forget that 
in order for us to have the, you know, this, this promise of extended longevity, we'd have to sort out a whole bunch of things, mainly attitudinal things or character, character logical things. I mean, lots of people pred have predicted that we would have this global pandemic, you know, even, you know, world leaders, even, you know, and yet everybody was so unprepared, or I think was so unprepared. We both are doing amazing things that you've just outlined in the last 20 minutes, or whatever. There's hundreds and hundreds of incredible things that were science fiction a few years ago. And yet we seem to, um, we seem to mess things up unless the gun is to our head. What, what, what do you hope the lessons learned are from this pandemic? And how do you make sure, as somebody who's, you know, you know, in this field, and uh, I, I would say you're, you have a lot of modesty, like, like it's somebody who's very important in this field of medicine. So how do you make sure those things happen and what are they? Well, some of them are, um, the silver lining of the pandemic in a sense is that it's catalyzed a lot of innovation, whether it's 3D printing ventilator parts in Italy, or um, software for contact tracing, even though there's public uh, privacy debates. It's catalyzed a lot of collaboration, data sets that have been opened, understanding genomics at the level of, you know, what, what patients and individuals, their genes are gonna impact their susceptibility to, to the disease. It's really catalyzed tele telemedicine, telehealth. So we're doing this talk virtually now. Um, today I'm actually having my very first um, virtual medical visit, a medical school classmate of mine is a cardiologist. I went in for a screening, um, uh, you know, normal uh, stress cardiac echo yesterday, because I have started working out like crazy in virtual reality, by the way. And I thought, oh, it's just time to check that my heart's all good. Everything seemed fine. They tried to, number one, they, they wanted to give me my uh, result, my results, my actually echocardiogram on a CD-ROM. You know, I don't own a CD-ROM player anymore. <laughs> um, but I will now have a virtual chat with my, with my Friend, the cardiologist this evening, but it's opened up virtual care, and part of that is changing the regulations. So uh, HIPAA compliance isn't broken if we're talking by Zoom. It's opened up the payment models so clinicians can get paid for. It. So that, there's some silver linings there in terms of rapid collaboration, rapid problem solving, the way improvisation happens in kind how you design a hospital or an ICU, and hopefully those things will play out to help prevent or respond to the next pandemic in much smarter ways. Um, testing, rapid testing, rapid vaccine development. All those will have sort of spin-off elements, some of which are hard to predict early on. Um, also, it's I think realizing that we're all we're all on planet Earth, and while you know, and this COVID pandemic has dramatically affected um, our our sort of global longevity. In the United States, the average number of years lost per death is 11 years. That's a lot of hopefully quality of life years. That's not all folks in their 80s and 90s in, in nursing facility nursing homes that have have died, that's been a good proportion, but there's been plenty of people in the 40s and 50s and early 60s who had many years of productive quality of life lost. So um, I, I hope it's gonna instill some of that political will. Yes, we had all the reason to believe this was coming, but the political will and the international systems and communication, even though the WHO has good, done good things in the past and the CDC, we can see failures of, of leadership and politics quite obviously getting in the way as our quote unquote president has, has recently said, let's slow down the testing. We don't, don't want to have too many bad numbers because that'll look bad politically. And that's frankly criminal. Yeah. Uh, yes, so, so you're seeing, so you're seeing these, these big bodies and indeed having more openness and more communication, more transparency. And that obviously would be a good thing. I mean, but obviously you want, I mean, from my understanding in your field, like scientists and, and medical practitioners need grants, need, funding or need to ally themselves with things to to work on um, uh, epidemi uh, I'm forgetting the word. Epid uh, when you study epidemics, epid epidemiology, right? Like mm -hmm. epidemiologists need money to, do, to go and do these studies. So I imagine there's going to be a whole onslaught of grants for these epidemics because of this, because of what's happened. What are the other things like this that are predicted that are under-resourced and hopefully we're not going to have to wait for that to happen for everybody to realize well we didn't put enough money in blah or blah so what are some of those things that feel like pandemic like global pandemics that that will hopefully get money and resources 
yeah, some of these have to really happen at the national, international scale. You, you know, even Bill Gates giving away all his money, <laughs> which he's done a good proportion, is not going to uh, take care of these things. Like the fact that the U.S. is, you know, trying to not un stop funding the WHO, or the fact that the White House uh, blocked the new funding of the NIH to study coronavirus uh, where it comes from. You know, so I think we have a lot of um, rebuilding to do in terms of public health. Um, from the US CDC to improving the WHO and beyond. And hopefully one of the things that'll come out of this is more of a uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the digital biomarkers and, and feelers of the whole planet, because we're realizing we're much more interconnected. Uh, it's, you know, COVID doesn't matter if you uh, uh, live in one state or another or a country or another. And if you have something that's like, if it's like pissing in a swimming pool, you know, what happens in one area spreads, spreads around, um, no matter your political equation, et cetera. So one of the things I think that'd be interesting to come out of this would be um, to understand that global health and public health is human health and ties to our health and longevity. Um, you know, whether it's sea levels rising in the setting of, of global warming, that hopefully this will catalyze other cross currents that will help solve for pandemics, but also global warming and all the, all the huge impacts those have on, on lives from pollution to, you know, fires to to other, um, to, to sea level change that has massive impacts on, on human life and quality of life. Um, one imagination I had with a friend of mine who's the chair of general pediatrics at Stanford, um, Dr. Lee Sanders would be imagine the next generation we have volunteer public health workers, just like you can be a volunteer fireman or a paramedic or EMT, that you, Johnny Boston, you could get trained up in an app and a virtual program to be a contact tracer, to help look at the health of your neighbors and community, um, to help, you know, know what to do when, when a, a disease comes through or to address um, a social um, disparity. And that those sort of volunteer efforts, leveraging technology and big data and hotspotting and machine learning can really help us uh, pick up problems when they're early. Just like in human health, you want to pick up that cardiovascular disease you know, early and start on that statin if it makes the most sense, or change your diet and meditate and uh, do yoga, which can reverse heart disease as well. So long answer to a, a, a simple, not a simple question, but I think Lots of potential things can come out of this if we have the right sort of political will and and and, and align uh, different parties to, to work together. How do we? I mean, that's, that's not your field, but I mean, do you see? And I mean, I look at all these things. I'm both optimistic and just when, like, how? What? What, what does it take for? people to come together and realize like we're all in this together we're living in a global environment we're living in a global world like so i mean what's your sense and again i know this isn't your field of what will create this you know a, a real public private partnership the way it's supposed to be yeah um i mean we have the fierce urgency of now right but we have a, <laughs> we have a bungled uh, national response some very good local responses um, and certainly the international level is very uneven. You can see, but we can learn, we're a learning engine. Um, I always love to use the example of, you know, crowdsourcing, um, talking about changes in technology, you know, 15 years ago, we all still drove with paper maps and uh, could, you know, we had some consciousness about where we were going. Now we all use GPS. Um, so we've off offloaded uh, some of our, our mapping, but now we crowdsource our maps with Google Maps and Waze. And using those maps, when we used to drive more, uh, we'd get to work faster. We'd avoid the, the accident. Um, you can see the new route that matched you. I'm hoping that we can kind of align the incentives to be data donors, whether that's as an individual, as a society, as a government, as a pharma company, as a hospital system, as a payer, so that a lot of the data is collecting and connecting. And it's not just big data, but it becomes actionable to you, to your governor, to your family, to you as an individual, to be proactive and, and, and optimize your health and wellness and, and precision wellness, et cetera, that will then lead to that long individual as well as social and um, uh, global uh, health span. Um, so part of it is, is connecting those dots. Some of that can only come from the leadership at the top because some of these require pretty big regulatory and, 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 and data shifts. And frankly, in some countries like where GDPR out of Europe is sort of over heavy handed, it makes it gets in the way of, of some innovations, just like in the United States, HIPAA has gotten in the way of, of arguably of, of many improvements that we could have in health and data flow in the name of patient safety. Hmm. The patient died with their privacy intact. Great. I think the patient was going to live <laughs> with their privacy uh, uh, not intact in, in any sense. So, well, it's, I mean, look, these are big questions. And, and, and in terms of 
privacy and efficacy and health and wellness and all of these things. And underneath everything you just said was the sort of subtext of a cell to an individual. Like, listen, like this is how it, this is how, this is the benefit. Like, and I feel like in some ways, I don't know if it's younger people or, or you know, the privacy thing isn't, maybe in Europe it's not such a big, I, I'm not sure exactly what the differential is. Um, but how do you sell in this idea that we, you need to give your data away or give it away? Give, maybe it's not about giving it away. It's about this is how it's going. Well, I think actually the giving it away isn't, is, is probably the wrong word to use but we are lending you our data for the following. Like, what, what is that conversation? What is the cell? So that, because everything yeah. you said in, in that whole thing was like, wow, that's brilliant. Like, I want all of that. But, but it needs to be a bit cleaner, I think, in terms of... Yeah, I, I don't think we all want to be feeling manipulated. We're, like, we're already being, probably on my laptop computer as we're speaking, there's so many cookies that have known where I've been and trying to target me. and. They know more about me than my wife might, you know, I think it's kosher. Um, <laughs> but uh, I imagine, um, but, that, but if it's a two way street, like with Google Maps or Waze, you're sharing your speed and location on the road. So that's pretty private information. You know, what are you doing at that motel at two in the morning or your speed? <laughs> um, but in exchange for sort of opting in, even if you don't opt in, you get that map back. So I think kind of that idea is like, if we're all sharing and becoming data donors and not necessarily all our private data and our social security number and our, our medication list but that can be shared in a um, smart way that we get something back and we feel like we're all in this together i'm a pediatric oncologist by training and pediatric oncology every kid with cancer was enrolled in a clinical trial still is pretty much almost 90 percent or more are versus adults which 20 percent or less you know it's that sort of crowdsourcing of clinical trials that's made great advancements in pediatric cancer care that then translated to adult cancer care so i think um it's a bit of a mindset shift um and, and yes, we should be able to use blockchain and other ways to keep things safe and secure and only shared when they need to be and de-anonymized. Um, there'll always be someone who's going to hack a system, just like credit cards get hacked, but we still use them. Um, so it's always going to be ways that technology can be good for you, good or bad. You can 3D print a medical device or a, a medication or 3D print a gun, right? Or you can use AI for good or for bad. Uh, all sorts of implications there. Or you could use genetic engineering to, to, to make a vaccine or to amplify the infectivity of a virus. Um, so I think uh, it's all about, you know, and I think what your movie does brilliantly is like help think about some of these things, you know, are often going faster than policy and ethics consider. And these conversations aren't often happening early enough. And the pace and acceleration of changes is accelerating even further that, you know, the next 10 years will make the last 10 years look slow. We need to have some of these conversations like, like, like FM uh, 2030, helps catalyze because the future is coming faster than we think. In terms of, and this is the same thing, but a slightly different spin on it. You know, you talked about HIPAA and there's, there's probably countless other, other FDA regulations and so on. But it seems to me like we, that, you know, in start off this conversation talk about transhumanism, even in transhumanism, there's all these different sort of wings and facets. It always reminds me of the um, life of Brian, the people's liberation front of, Judea, the, you know, there's all these different branches of transhumanism. One is like, oh, take the training wheels off and let companies do whatever they want, and we will, the market will decide, and you know, we'll um, have brilliant drugs, and and no one will get killed, and everything will be fine. I'm more, I personally, more in the vein that we do need some regulation. We do need, like, especially as these technologies become more and more commonplace, where somebody will be able to do CRISPR in their in their in their bedroom. You know, I mean, so as these things become, and they will, I mean, you know, I don't know if that may be crazily far off, but there are some, but well, maybe not. Oh, I mean, you're, you're by so, a so, it, it, I could be crispering some bacteria in my, in my garage or so. What, so what used to take a multi-million dollar academic lab can now be done by a couple of kids. Uh, they can also start leveraging big data and looking at genomics and, and, and using AI to predict what, CRISPR needs to be done. And it's a good example. So more recently was about a year ago, the Chinese doctor, he uh, CRISPRized the, 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 you know, very unethically, not in the normal pattern of, of clinical trials to at least two uh, Chinese babies, right? And that caused a huge blow up. Um, but that's sort of the genie getting out of the bottle. Um, and, you know, it's got great potential positive power too. CRISPR has been shown to be able to be utilized to 
or similar gene editing things for curing sickle cell disease or thalassemia. Uh, but what happens when you start to knock in genes or out genes for intelligence or blue eyes or stronger muscles or longevity related genes, uh, some of which are quite big, you know, getting- We also don't know if they can, they can remove certain genes for, this, for some terrible disease. We also don't know, you know, the implications of that. It may remove the disease, but it may have some of, may be also important for, I don't know, something else. <laughs> right, the classic example is sickle cell disease. It's com more common in African-Americans. Uh, if you carry one copy of the gene, you're actually protected, relatively protected from malaria. So it's adaptive, but if you get the two together, that's when you get the disease. So sometimes, yeah, knocking something out may have unforeseen circumstances. The best example I think you, 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 you or some of your friends know about is the Asilomar meetings that happened in the early 1970s, led by my old Stanford Medical School professor, Paul Berg, Nobel laureate, uh, to, to help the, the folks at the beginning of molecular biology think about how to self-regulate a little bit and make the field safe because the time was like, oh, you're playing God, you're splicing genes, it should be completely outlawed. And by smartly getting together and sort of self-policing, that's happening also in the AI world as well now, um, it helped the biotech field explode and arguably, you know, millions of lives have been saved by the bio, you know, by the molecular biology revolution from making insulin, you know, that Genentech started with to new immunotherapies. So, you know, there's a slippery, slippery, slippery slope between, you know, being fear-based and over-regulating, but letting things emerge in ways that you still can't predict. So is there, I mean, as you think about some of the things that actually have worked and, and you've seen some of the things that haven't worked. Is there, is there at least philosophically a way to think about how to regulate this? I mean, because obviously, I mean, rules can change and grow and so on. But we need we need to have something because, this, as you say, this this isn't far into the future at all. I mean, people can create all sorts of things because they have that ability and the technology is there. And I'm not sure that regulation is necessarily going to solve that, but there are things that I imagine um, we can do that can help, that can actually give us more promise of the, the, the uses of this technology in better ways than, than destructive ways or in ways that we, don't, we, we cannot predict. Yeah, I mean, there's always um, people who will hack a system. I mean, even... Uh, uh, think about our FDA, you know, you need to get a prescription to get a very basic, generic, safe antibiotic for a urinary tract infection. So you have to go through all those hoops and jumps to get an antibiotic. You can go you know, somewhere in South America and the pharmacist can give it to you or, or it's sold on the street or something that's highly regulated here in the US um, is happening, you know, in a very unregulated way in parts of Asia. And so in our globally competitive market, you know, some of the innovators are going to go to places offshore where the regulations and barriers are lower and that can lead to issues like the CRISPR baby situation or others that have other implications. So, so it sometimes maybe it takes, um, again, now global and local, local um, uh, regulatory mindsets for some of these things to set some global policies, particularly when these technologies have so much of potentially immense power, you know, that's happened in the nuclear field, it's happened in molecular biology, I'm starting to think about it with AI and synthetic biology and, and artificial life. So. Uh, I am not a bioethicist or regulatory expert, I, but I think we need, do need to have these conversations. And sometimes using the sort of science fiction modalities or, uh, or, or nonfiction, everything like shows like Westworld to upload to, to your you know, great movie, um, help some of those things feel more real or movies like Gattaca. You know, Gattaca was 22 years ago about you know, the genetic haves and not haves. And you know the baby being sequenced in the born. Now you can sequence the baby before they're born and have some idea about their genes related to intelligence or risk of heart disease or Alzheimer's. That might mean you can do some good things about proactively managing that baby and optimizing them, or they could be discriminated against. That was you know that seemed science fiction 22 years ago. Again, now you can sequence that baby in utero, and potentially your insurance company can have your 23andMe profile. So. Um, I think uh, it, these things catalyze the conversation uh, sometimes 20 years early, and that's important. Yeah, what other things do we need to be thinking about so we're not then confronted with some, something like what we're going through now and we can be better prepared in, in, in medicine? No, oh, what are those sort of holy shit moments? Uh, I mean, we're gonna have a pandemic uh, of, of dementia as our population ages. That's already this huge age wave is emerging, right? The baby boomers all getting into their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, not enough uh, caregivers 
you know, like in places like Japan, uh, where the population is getting dramatically older with a lot, a lot of reproduction. So those are sort of slow, uh, slow pandemics in a sense that uh, that we need to address um, or be much more on top of. Um, you know, I don't think anything quite matches the level of an infectious pandemic that is exponential and can spread from, you know, two cases to, you know, a million in, in uh, two months. This is something I talked about with my son and it was sort of interesting, but I didn't have any of the answers. You know, why scientists keep all these, these viruses, the, these viruses or, or even biomaterials that, you know, have these catastrophic qualities and are dangerous and whether they should be kept in, I, I forgot which one, smallpox, he was talking about smallpox. Yeah, so, so tell, I mean, that to me is also both, I mean, I can see the argument for retaining it, but I, I imagine that how we think about those things is, again, something that we need to put thought in because it can have these catastrophic, it can have catastrophic scenarios. Is that one and are there offshoots of that specific? And do you have the answer why? Why do we keep it? I'm not allowed to tell you, but uh, even if I knew, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, there are some reasons that in the right high level biologic facility, still having those samples there uh, could inform and help you create a new vaccine, or understand the biology of something similar. So there are probably some very good reasons to keep those things on ice, um, but it does come with some risks. There have been several examples of, uh, of you know, Ebola samples or others getting lost in the mail or uh, being taken to places they shouldn't have been, um, you know. And, and now, just like with the computer virus, these sorts of things can spread around the world. You know, you can be on a flight anywhere in the world in 24 hours, at least when our airlines were flying normally. So um, I, I don't know if I can properly answer the question of your son. I think there's some good reasons to, to, to safely keep those samples so we can use them to understand those diseases and others to help prevent and be proactive or respond to other similar um, infectious elements. In medicine, anything I haven't heard you talk about, I don't think, is sort of nanomedicine. And that was something that, again, I first heard about it from FM, and I don't know, I haven't heard about it lately. But is that something, is, is what's going on in the world of nanomedicine? Um, I mean, that's just the idea of things that get smaller and smaller. If it's true nanomedicine, something, you know, the size of a red blood cell, you don't, we don't quite yet have nanobots. But we are seeing, you know, with synthetic biology, the ability to, you know, modify viruses. Those are really little uh, biologic machines, in a sense, that are not alive in some definitions, um, uh, or some clever um, potential, you know, cancer or other therapies that ride, um, you know, small magnets and can target. So I think we are in an era of sort of nanomedicine today, depending how you define it. We're not yet miniaturizing, you know, complete cells, but we can now using, you know. Craig Venters and other works, you know, now may create a whole cell synthetically, you know, print the, so essentially print the uh, genome and have that turn into a, a, an organism and potentially multicellular organisms. So that counts, I think, as a form of nanobiology. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess even like this idea of, of printing organs because it's on a cellular level. So I guess, you know, I'm, and I'm at, I mean, I remember talking to you about that a long time ago. Where are we in terms of printing organs? from people's uh, you know, It's advanced, but we're not anywhere close to like 3D printing a complex organ like a heart or a kidney or, or liver, liver. There's some pretty amazing work out of Mass General and others are getting, you know, to make a 3D printed kidney, it doesn't need to look like the kidney that comes out of you or, a, or, a, or an animal. I think in some ways other technologies are gonna um, move past that. And this actually is a question for super longevity here. Um, you may have heard, you know, talked about gene editing CRISPR. Uh, groups that started in George Church's lab in Boston um, now have a company called eGenesis that they're humanizing pigs. So you can take a human sized pig, you know, they're 200, 300 pounds. You can knock out some of the genes for pig antigens and their immune system genes. You can knock in some of the genes from humans. And when you take a heart or a kidney from that pig and it has some of the right uh, immune markers from humans and knocks out some of the sugars and others that come from that pig you can have a humanized pig organ that can be used for xenotransplantation. So we might argue, it might be a little animal farmish, but if you're on the organ tr transplant wait list, which is often long, and it might not be kosher, but you'll take that organ um, from the pig. And that might essentially extend the lifespans of people who would otherwise be dying of heart disease 
or, or cancers where they have to lose a liver or, uh, or beyond. So that's where I think it's almost going to trump the ability and need to 3D print a complex organ because we'll already have all that complexity coming from, from a, a humanized animal. But it's fun. I, mean, I wonder if I have a feeling that the rabbinet would make it kosher because you're saving a life. In theory, you, everything yeah. trumps everything, right? If you're saving a life, it trumps. The Tom would say, it's a bit of a tongue in cheek joke, but. Uh, I know, uh, no, but it, I was playing out the joke. I like playing out the joke. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure all sorts of things are allowed when you save a life. Uh, you know, I think uh, the, 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 the Orthodox rabbi can have a, a pig heart valve. I don't think that's a problem. But, um, but it does uh, bring up the question like, who's going to get those organs? How do you ration, ra ration them? If, you know, we certainly ration regular organ transplants, but when you could have an animal farm, <laughs> um, you could have, be, have your own Johnny Boston pig ready to go, or you may have your own personalized stem cell lines that have been uh, manipulated and turned into your own organs in the freezer. So that's a whole other sort of flip on the equation. We're not gonna freeze your brain at the end of life for, for, for whatever reason. We'll just keep replacing body parts in clever enough ways to the point where you, you're, you're getting rebuilt just like you, know, you see a Model T going down the street right now. Uh, it's a hundred and something year old car. Most of those parts have been slowly replaced over time. And some of them are hard to get, and some of them are now hand manufactured, but it's still a Model T. <laughs> so we are, uh, I think- we are, we are all ships of Theseus. We're all yeah. re 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 rebuilt all the time. In, in terms of, um, in, in, in your own feelings around some of these, some of these, um, what do they call them? Modifications. What, I mean, I know that you're, you, in some ways, you're very gung ho about all the, 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 the latest tech. So, as we start being able to have various modifications or enhancements, what ones are you are you jumping on? What what's like you know as they come up, you're jumping on. Uh, you know, I tried some of these early versions of these you know little brain stimulation devices you could wear. I think there's a couple of versions uh, that'll help theoretically improve your cognition. Um, or your memory or your ability to solve problems. Uh, uh, that, that'd be a kind of an interesting one to see how that plays out. I think um, all the world of augmented reality, you know, extending our, our, our senses, you know, we're, we're gonna have these, Apple and others are working on them heavily, gonna augment our, our ability to, to sense and integrate and synthesize information. Um, um, I think um, new ways of uh, optimizing our physiology by understanding the integration systems medicine of our microbiome, our genome, our metabolome, our proteome. You know, we have all these siloed segments, but as we start to put those dots together and create our own sort of digital twins, we can learn to sort of optimize our personal health and those of our patients in the society. So those are a couple of things. Uh, I'm trying to think of other fun things I'd like to try. Jetpack, I got to fly a jetpack, a, a real actual one. Oh yeah, yeah, I, saw the, I think I saw a video, it was on, you put it on Facebook, I think, on one of those. Or yeah, jet so engine, you know, two on each arm, one on your back. That was fun, harder than it looks. Uh, you know, but I love flying. I'm a pilot. I think uh, yeah. we have a, 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 one with more than, you know, five minutes worth of gas, <laughs> but uh, flying, personal flying would be kind of fun. Um, so but I was more thinking about like, but I mean, are you, like bionic eyes, like, I mean, or specifically if you can, can like take some sort of, you know, have some sort of gene therapy where you suddenly become, you know, a thousand times stronger or whatever it is. I mean, those things, you know, those things are going to come online. You know whether they come online first and how we manage them that's you know probably a conversation for another day but like as they come online which ones are you jumping on i mean i've been talking about the more sort of out there ones like the, su the superhero packs that probably we market as the superhero packs you can sure. imagine uh, spider-man well, never flying uh vision always be great i mean i'm getting close to needing reading glasses which i don't want to go there um uh, I think, you know, memory is always one. If we can start to hack sleep, just think if we could have great energy, thought, focus, productivity, um, but only need three hours to sleep as opposed to six. I mean, that's still another one of those brain mysteries, which seems to be very tied to long, long, longevity and health. If you're not sleeping enough and not getting enough deep REM, um, that's in a whole other area. But it'd be interesting if we could hack that in a healthy way. Um, people are certainly trying. Um, I'm always a little bit wary of all these sort of fad diets and, and activities. Uh, a lot of them are, are hard to prove out, um, but sure, superhero me, I'm ready. The superhero pack, you're 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 you're, you're getting that. Uh, so to sort of to, to end this, um, biggest fear, biggest hope about in terms of our near future. 
Wow. I mean, this feels like a really fearful, fearful time on the planet. I mean, we're here now speaking in uh, late June of 2020, and uh, we're in the second wave. We're never even finished our first wave here in the United States. Other countries are doing much, much better. There's a lot of fear about all the downstream implications economically, mentally, societally, with all the, I mean, now in the conflagration of Black Lives Matter, an election coming up. So I'm a little fearful. I've got young kids, four, six, and 17. You know, what's the world going to look like for them um, in a few years? In terms of fear, I mean, I think we need to like rise to the occasion. There's that uh, Apollo, Apollo 13 famous story where Gene Krantz was in Apollo uh, in, in Johnson Space Center and Apollo 13 had blown blown its oxygen tank and they thought, oh, this is going to be the biggest disaster for Apollo of all time. And he turned and by report, he said, no, this, this will actually be uh, NASA's finest hour. And um, my hope is that, you know, instead of having completely fear-based, a lot of the great activities and energy and collaborations will hopefully make this humanity's finest hour in our response to COVID. It's not going that well, at least out of the White House, um, but a lot of people are, frontline workers, public health folks, a lot of folks trying super hard. And again, I think some of the things, my, my hope is that a lot of the things that come out of this crisis, which is Chinese for what, uh, decision and opportunity, uh, are going to lead to, to some, you know, better, brighter future. And just like we saw in downturns economically in 2008, a lot of things came out of that uh, in terms of um, entrepreneurship and innovation and technology and, and, and progress. So um, I tend to be an optimist, so I don't want to go too far down the fear side, but I am definitely a bit concerned, but also an optimist, meaning that a lot of the good things will come out of this. And um, and as we think about health span and longevity and super longevity, um, you know, how do we make that fair for everybody, not just for the you know the super rich, um, but also still spend a good amount of our time and attention on on just doing the simple things and giving people basic access to clean water, vaccination, health, connect to connection to sort of optimize their own um, health and longevity and, and the Good things they can do for the rest of the planet. Inshallah, uh, you know, I hope, I really do. I really hope that this is that, that we that this is a learning time and that we we get our shit together. But I think I think I, I, I I'm an optimist, so I, I think we will. I mean, I, I think we will. I really do think we will. We have to. We've got young kids. Yeah, I mean, you're an optimist. Uh, HM twenty thirty is an optimist in many ways. I mean, and you need these crazy thinkers and optimists and and the artists like you that can help transmit the vision. I mean, just like Star Trek, it's, you know, maybe you know, Star Trek is a good example of, of looking at some parts of the optimistic future. Many of those things have inspired the Elon Musks and the technologists and the medical tricorders of, of today. So um, it helps to be an optimist. You can always watch dystopian movies too. Um, yeah, and I think you need a healthy balance of both. <laughs>